What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this place. Oh, well. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. This is a story about stolen treasure. When do we divide the gold? And lots of golden booty. And yes, this tale will take us out on the high seas, in sailing ships, but it really begins in the mountains, or the Judean hills. Okay, hold on, guys, hold on. Because we're hunting for treasure that came from the temple in Jerusalem. We're in Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives, across from one of the holiest places on earth. The Muslims call it the Dome of the Rock. According to Islam, it's where Muhammad ascended to heaven to learn the ways of prayer. For Jews, it's the Temple Mount. Why? Because if you went back in time, 3,000 years, on that exact spot, you'd see the Temple of Solomon, one of the wonders of the earth, built by King Solomon. And it was there to house the symbols of ritual, of communication between God and mankind. The temple treasures were considered holy hotlines to God. The Golden Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments. The massive candelabra or menorah was designed by God Himself and it was made from one piece of gold. The silver trumpets of truth were blown by the high priest to mark the beginning and end of every workday. And the gorgeous gold and bejeweled table of the Divine Presence held the fresh bread, blessed by God, ensuring a successful annual grain harvest. This was some serious booty. Control these, and you had access to God, who controls heaven, the seas, and all between and below. So what happened to the temple treasure? Where did it go? And how come King Solomon's temple is not there anymore? With a keen eye for clues in history, I can answer the temple questions, and, as crazy as it may sound, I think I can find the priceless temple treasures. In 586 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, sacked Jerusalem, and his massive army burned and knocked Solomon's temple down. He captured all the Jewish people and took them back to Babylon, and he claimed their temple treasure. Ancient records show that Nebuchadnezzar took everything but the Ark of the Covenant. Many legends claim the Ark was secretly hidden before the Babylonians attacked the temple. So before I go to Babylon, I'm starting my hunt. Here, deep underneath the Temple Mount, where archaeologist Dan Bahat has uncovered evidence that points to an ancient secret vault. This is one of the most exciting points in the Western Wall. We are touching now a stone, which is the largest building stone ever found in this country. It weighs 600 metric tons, which is enormous. I believe inside here, there is a vault, let's say an underground storage place or something of the like. So could it be, in theory, a storage of the temple? That's what I believe it is. Really? Precisely that, yes. I'll tell you more than that. This so you're going to find the lost Ark of the Covenant hidden on what the other side? What do you mean? Side? I'm in Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you blasting through the wall and be an Indiana Jones and find uh, all sorts of treasures? People are expecting me to find the Ark of the Covenant. It will be never found. Because in the book of Maccabees, it describes how po Prophet Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant to Mount Nebo. The book of Maccabees says that Jeremiah stashed the Ark in a cave up here on Mount Nebo in Jordan. But there has never been anything found up here. Many academics are convinced that the Ark was destroyed when King Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Solomon's temple back in 586 BCE, because after that moment, ancient references to the Ark disappear. However, the Babylonians did make off with the bigger booty. All the treasures except the Ark were taken to Babylon. There, they stayed for almost 50 years until Cyrus, king of the Persians, overthrew Babylon, freed the Jews, and allowed them to return to their land. It was then that they brought back the sacred objects of Solomon's temple. So, I may not be able to find the Ark, but with the help of this exact model of ancient Jerusalem, I can put myself back in time 
to uncover clues to the other treasure's whereabouts. I just need to get things down to scale. That's good. And the Jewish people came back from Babylon and they built the second temple right over Solomon's temple, the first temple. And this is what it looked like. And, well, not exactly like that, it was bigger. It was magnificent. And inside that Holy of Holies, that's where the high priest had the temple treasure. They had everything they had before in the first temple, except the Ark of the Covenant that went missing. But they had everything else, the menorah, the trumpets, the golden table. They had everything, worth millions even in those days, priceless really. But in today's terms, in hard cash, billions. And guess what? The second temple wasn't just the holiest place to worship and store expensive holy things. It was a bank, a massive bank for all of Israel, kind of like an ancient Fort Knox. It housed gold and silver reserves and it was where the temple's tax collection was deposited. Inside the temple, at any given time, was what today would be billions and billions of dollars worth of gold and silver in the form of coins and big bricks called talents. So what happened to the second temple? Why is it not there? And what happened to the temple treasure and to the gold and silver talents? Well, in 70 CE, 27 years after the death of Jesus, Rome sacked Jerusalem, destroyed it. The Emperor Vespasian sent his son and best general, Titus, to knock down the second temple of Jerusalem. And all the clues we need to figure out what the Romans did with the treasure are in an ancient history book written by a man named Josephus. The greatest written authority that we have is Flavius Josephus. He's an eyewitness to the events that happened to Jerusalem and to the temple treasure. What does he have to say about the temple treasure? Josephus writes that the Romans grabbed all the temple booty, including the great menorah, and they made off like toga-wearing bandits back to Rome. And that's where this treasure hunt takes us. Rome. It's the year 70 CE. The Roman legions have sacked Jerusalem, stolen its holy temple treasures, and we've chased them back to Rome to witness a triumph celebration unlike any seen before. Here is where it all started, at the Pantheon. Not this Pantheon, which was built in 118, but the earlier Pantheon destroyed by a fire. Imagine the scene. The Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus were right here. They were dedicated to their gods and started marching. And this is where the temple treasure was made ready to be paraded along what I call the Via della Menorah. They took it all the way through Rome, throngs of cheering people as the holiest objects in Judaism were suddenly paraded as trophies of victorious Rome. But where did the treasure end up? If we read Josephus, we can actually draw a treasure map tracing the path of the menorah and the other temple riches as they were paraded through Rome. Vespasian and Titus made their way from the Pantheon to the Circus Flaminus. Here, they were heralded by tens of thousands. Historian Alan Epstein shows me that the Circus Flaminus, the first station in this triumphal parade, is today covered by a very interesting building. We're standing in front of the major synagogue of Rome. This synagogue was built when? Uh, 1904. But this is where they brought the temple treasure after conquering Jerusalem in 70, starting it here, parading it all around the city so that everyone can see. And so there's a synagogue right on the spot where this temple treasure began its, its triumphal march through the city. That's a real irony. Well, that's history. History is irony. And it's the irony of unintended consequences. The irony is intriguing, but I'm not interested in irony. I'm interested in gold. Epstein tells me that almost 2,000 years ago, they paraded the treasures from here into the Teatro de Marcello, which held 11,000 spectators. This is all part of the theater of Marcellus. This was the prototype of the Colosseum, and of course, it extends into the ancient part, which is around. We're now at the front part where the stage was. But the gold wasn't left on the stage. According to Josephus, the treasure parade left this amphitheater, marched down the Vicus Jagarius, 
and through the Circus Maximus. Just a park now, but back then it held an estimated 250,000 screaming Romans. The holiest items of Judea were then taken into the famous Roman Forum, where the Senate was housed and their most sacred temple stood. And it's here where we find the best clue yet. Actual archaeological evidence of the menorah and the rest of the temple treasures carved into Roman stone. This is the Arch of Titus. This is it. The Arch of Titus is the commemoration of the triumph of Emperor Vespasian and his son Titus, built directly on the path that they marched into Rome after the destruction of Jerusalem. I met with historian Leah Klein, who explained to me the significance of this structure. So this is literally, it's kind of a still frame of one of the most incredible moments in history. It was a big deal. On this panel on the south side, it's the beginning of the triumphal procession into the city of Rome. And you can see them proceeding with all of their booty to show the people in the Senate of Rome what they were able to accomplish and what they were to bring back. This booty obviously is the most important booty. You see the menorah um, and you have soldiers holding it on their shoulders. As it is brought to Rome, it represents Rome's dominance of, of the known universe at that time. So are you saying that the temple treasure literally was paraded where we're standing now? It would have been paraded on this route. It would have come up from what is now the Colosseum, uphill, and then proceed down through the Roman Forum. As Leah takes me down the Via Sacra, the oldest and most important road in Rome, we follow the treasure's path, and she paints a vivid scene. Any of the areas in the Forum that were not covered with buildings would have been clamoring with people. At the front of the procession would have been Vespasian and Titus together, riding on what's a, called a quadriga, which is a four-horse chariot with these four white horses. Behind them would have been a series of guards, uh, lictors, holding the standards of the emperor. And then behind them would have been the marching troops in which they were carrying the booty. Following the booty was Shimon Bar Giora, the leader of the Jewish revolt, walking his last steps before execution. Behind him were thousands of his Jewish people, now slaves to Rome. Quite a show. It was quite a show, absolutely. Rome was all about the spectacle, and this was the utmost of spectacles. And, and bringing these spoils back meant that Rome um, had pacified part of the world. I can't help but shoulder my menorah in a symbolic gesture. How many people know of this triumphant and tragic tale of stolen holy treasures? Did she tell you about the menorah? The temple treasure of Jerusalem was taken right through here. Did you know that? Awesome. It went all the way up there. And that's, that's the Arch of Titus, right over there. Did you see it? No, I didn't see <laughs> you're, it when you're, I was there. I'll have to get it? back. No, Did no. you see it? Didn't oh, realize. You yeah. want to schlep my menorah? You want me to schlep your menorah? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> your menorah is very heavy. <laughs> you want to come to see it? Did you see it? We're starting a new custom, the Via della Menorah. <laughs> see, there's the Arch of Titus. There's the silver trumpets. And there is the menorah. And they paraded it at various stations along this exact route. And they buried it where? Now that's a good question. Jerusalem's treasure, stolen and paraded around Rome. Did the Latin looters bury it or melt it down? Is it so crazy to think that I can find it? Leah Klein takes me to the edge of the Forum to see the Temple of Peace, or what's left of it. This shows you a map of what was there in the color blocks. She tells me that after the triumphal procession, a new Roman temple was built here to display the booty from Roman conquests. Okay, I'm excited because I feel that we're standing where the temple treasure was for centuries. Well, it was certainly um, a tourist attraction even in the Roman period. The Temple of Peace was more of an art museum than a temple. And what we understand is that the menorah, the golden table, and the silver trumpets were brought to the Temple of Peace and put on display. And what you're seeing in these outlines of, of wall foundation um, and marble tile um, is a garden structure that would have been in front of the, the temple itself. The excavations are going on right now? They have been going on in the last several years by an Italian university. The problem with this particular area is the modern road behind us. It was put up by Mussolini and it has completely destroyed the archaeology beneath it. So this is as much as we probably will find, at least in this, in this lifetime. And we very well may be standing over where the menorah had been housed? That or the buses behind us, directly. However mundane that might be. <laughs> <laughs> Could the holiest icons of Judea really be buried underneath a Roman bus stop? 
did the Romans permanently imprison the treasure's divine energy under the so-called Temple of Peace? Josephus gives us more clues. And this is what he has to say. The Emperor Vespasian, like any savvy pirate, split up the booty. And like any savvy money holder, he invested a lot of it in real estate. We're circling the Colosseum, stuck in a Roman traffic jam. The Colosseum is an amazing structure. The biggest amphitheater on the planet, an engineering marvel. In today's terms, it would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars, more expensive than a 3D Hollywood IMAX film. Where did they get the money? To answer that question, I needed to get inside for a little clapping and a lesson from Colosseum expert Mino okay. Carboni. Where are we? Oh, we are in uh, the symbol of Rome, Colosseum. It is the largest amphitheater in the Roman Empire. It was built to accommodate some 70,000 people. And uh, they took only eight years just to, to complete it. Uh, 2,000 years ago, this was built. The place would be full, like 70 to 100,000 people. The Roman emperor was here. Everybody was here. What were they doing here? They were feeding Christians to the lion? No. What? We have no evidence that they gave Christian to feed animals in the arena. The arena had three different functions. In the morning, the venazione, which is the fighting between gladiators and animals. Then at noon, we had the public execution of regular criminals in the arena. The matinee was was gladiators again, against animals. animals. Yes, they Lunchtime, just, that was public execution. execution. In the afternoon, they had the moneda, gladiators against the gladiators. Gladiator against, against gladiator. gladiator. Mano was, a mano. This was just the use of the Colosseum when fighting, but they also had a particular performances, especially when they want to reproduce mythology or the very important Greek dramas. For this reason, they changed the, the stage. The stage is the huge platform down there. This, this was filled in, right? Right? We're seeing a big hole here. Yes. We're actually seeing uh, underneath the stage. Indeed. So what's the connection between the Colosseum, which was built by Vespasian, and the wars in Jerusalem, the destruction of That's Jerusalem? That's a very interesting question. We know for sure that uh, a big number of prisoners came to Rome. All of, the, of them were Jewish, and all of them yeah. built the Colosseum here. Yeah. They built this place? Yes. So imagine how many thousand people had to wear how much money they needed. So we're, we're talking in today's money, over a billion dollars, oh. thousands of slaves. I don't think we can give a value. In a way, you could say that the Colosseum is built on the ashes of Jerusalem's temple. On Jerusalem. We can say that since they defeated, they destroyed the second temple, the money for the Colosseum came from the booty of Jerusalem, for, of course, because they need a lot of money. It's a strong statement to make. The greatest symbol of Rome built on conquered Jewish backs with the blood and gold of Judea. But Mino tells me the proof is written in stone. Historian Mino Carbone says he has the most solid of proof that the emperors Vespasian and Titus built the most iconic symbol of ancient Rome with stolen Jewish temple talents. He shows me a massive altar-like stone that he believes used to sit above the emperor's entrance to the Colosseum. This is a block of marble, actually, and there is a beautiful inscription, 4th century inscription. It's late. It's very late. It's not an inscription that belonged to the 1st century AD. Actually, no. Mino tells me that the chiseled Latin in this stone describes how Lampadius, a prefect of Rome, had the Colosseum restored in 443 CE. There's nothing that mentions the Jewish temple treasure or the emperors that we're interested in. But, but this inscription doesn't really say Vespasian or Titus. No, of course, it's been deleted. Uh, we can see some holes. Normally, a very original inscription was chiseled in the marble, then fill in with the bronze letters that were claps against the marble with the pins inside. We can see the holes everywhere. So let me see if I understand. You're telling me that the inscription I see with my eyes, this inscription is not the original inscription. Yes, you're right. This was added. Layer. And the way we know what the original inscription is from the pin marks, because yes. they were holding bronze letters. Yes. The bronze normally was added just to give a shining to the inscription on the marble. So can we retrieve the original inscription? Can we tell by the pins? Yes, you can reconstruct piece by piece just following the holes 
that were used for the bronze letters. So we can connect the dots. Yes, you can. And that's exactly what archaeologists did in 2001. They deciphered the puzzle that showed that this inscription was added in the 4th century. Stonemasons chipped away the evidence of the earlier 1st century inscription. But the older pinholes, still visible on the surface today, clearly correspond to different lettering. So what does the inscription actually say when you connect the dots? They say that the, the amphitheater was built by the emperor Vespasian with a share of the booty coming from the Jewish wars to show the world that the Vespasian, in building the Colosseum, wanted to share the booty with them, building just a public amphitheater. So basically, this is a real piece of archaeological detective work that, taken together with the Arch of Titus, shows proof positive that the temple treasure came here, but also that the temple treasure was used to build the greatest building in the world at that time. Yes, I agree. So it's true. The Emperor Pirate Vespasian had split the booty. He spent the most liquid assets on the Colosseum and, most likely, on many other Roman structures of the time. When we look at this marvelous feat of Roman engineering, we know now that it was built with temple treasure, but not all the treasure. I found ancient writings that tell us the Romans kept the holiest temple icons intact, safe, solid, and unspent inside their temple of peace. These writings describe yet another looting of the booty, and they tell us where the treasure went and where it still may be. But to find Jerusalem's gold, we'll just have to wait until next time on The Naked Archaeologist. He's a total man.